Okay, welcome everybody uh, to our penultimate C Prime talk of the semester. So, if you don't know, C Prime is a student org. Uh, it's devoted to increasing diversity, equity, inclusion here on campus, and specifically in the physics department. And one of the ways we do that is through this talk series. Um, so today we are going to hear a talk from Claire Hansel, who is a current grad student here, and she is going to tell us about the world's weirdest laser. So at any point, uh, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt, and uh, we'll also have times of discussion throughout. And with that, I'll let you take it away. Great. Um, thank you so much, everybody. So uh, my name is Claire Hansel. I'm a... Uh, um graduate student researcher in uh, Mike Leos' lab. And first, I guess I'd like to thank uh, CU Prime for the wonderful opportunity to give this talk, as well as CU Boulder, the physics department here, and um, all of you who have come both in person and online, and some of my wonderful friends who joined online. So thank you, everybody. Um, so the world's weirdest laser is what I am affectionately calling the ion channel laser, which is the subject of my research. Um, so to, to begin, I'll talk a little bit about the outline. First, I'm going to introduce particle accelerators. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how regular lasers work, non-weird ones. And then finally, I'm going to talk about a classical laser called the free electron laser, which is kind of the world's second weirdest laser. And then finally, the ion channel laser, and I'll end on a, a couple of points. So um, please don't be afraid to ask questions at any point. I'm always happy to answer questions if you don't understand something. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. So I studied physics at UCLA. I worked in the accelerator physics laboratory of uh, Professor James Rosenzweig there. I started doing research my the end of my first year as an undergrad. Um, I was an intern at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory in California. Um, it used to stand for Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. It doesn't really do that anymore, but it's just Slack now. But um, yeah, so I'm now a second year graduate student with uh, Professor Michael Litos, the best advisor in the world. And um, I am working on ion channel laser physics mostly, a lot of sort of theory and simulation for now, experiments at some point. Um, and then I'm also a person. I have hobbies. I like watching sappy rom coms and I have a 40 mile an hour electric scooter. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, also, I'm, I'm a transgender woman and I transitioned my second year of undergrad. Um, and I've been living my best life, life ever since. So. So yeah, so I guess, sorry, to begin, um, I kind of have two goals for this talk. So the first is to just sort of talk about my research. Um, but the second goal is to introduce everybody here to a field of physics that you may not have heard of. It's called accelerator physics. And I'll talk a little bit about that now. So it's a branch of applied physics that studies um, creating beams, accelerating beams, manipulating and using these beams. Um, these are charged particle beams, electrons, protons, or other things. Um, so it's almost an entirely classical field. There's very little quantum mechanics involved, although in parts of the field, um, there are definitely sort of uh, quantum things that people study. Um, so due to their size and cost, accelerators are typically found at national laboratories, not universities. So our country, the US, is a system of uh, federally funded national labs, the Department of Energy. Um, a lot of other countries have similar federally funded labs, but they tend to, accelerators tend to be less common at universities. And sort of because of this, um, accelerator physics classes and research groups tend to be a little bit less common. And even some very good universities don't have um, accelerator physics research. We sort of have some accelerator physics research going on. Um, we have two professors, Michael Litos and John Carey, who work on plasma acceleration. Although that's, that's a little bit different than sort of classical accelerator physics. Um, and the universities that tend to have these courses and research groups are usually associated with national labs. Um, and finally, I have to explain this to my parents a lot. It's not particle physics. So we, um, we definitely work on particle colliders on how they're constructed, how they're made, how the beams inside of them circulate and the stability of those. Um, but when we collide them, we don't really care what happens when you do collide them. That is the job of high energy physicists to sort of piece out what happens and the sort of the fundamental physics, but we're just more involved in the actual accelerators. So, um, so now to begin, uh, what is the particle accelerator? It is a machine that uses electromagnetic fields to accelerate and focus charged particle beams. So there are kind of three main parameters for any particle accelerator. There's whether or not it's a linear where it goes through once or a circular where it goes through many times. It doesn't actually have to be a circle. It could be an oval or any other shape. Um, the species, um, which is usually electrons, protons, or sometimes heavy ions, 
Uh, CU actually does have a small dust accelerator, which is really cool because it can accelerate these charged dust grains. Um, then finally, the energy per particle is typically given in electron volts. And that tells you sort of a lot about the scale of a particle accelerator. Um, and those can range from sort of lower energy in the KEV or MEV um, to very high energy in the GEV or TEV. Um, so accelerators have a lot of applications in medicine, industry, and research. Um, cancer treatment, ion implantation is important for semiconductor manufacturing. And the most flashy is definitely the particle colliders. Um, and then one other thing, which is just a physics fact, um, which is a very recurring theme in this talk, is that if you have a charged particle and it accelerates, either it changes its speed or it um, changes the trajectory, like if it goes in a circle, um, like an orbit or something, then it will produce radiation. And we can use that radiation. It's called synchrotron radiation. We can use it for a lot of different things. So, um, and then here we have IOTA, which is a Fermi lab, which is a national lab in Chicago. Also, fun fact about this accelerator, they can ma they manage to inject and circulate a single electron around this machine, which I thought was super cool when I learned it. So um, now I'd like to ask everybody, um, how do you think you would go about accelerating a beam of charged particles um, and discuss with your neighbor for maybe you know, three or five minutes? Okay, everybody. Um, so thanks for, for discussing. Um, are there, there any answers that people have come up with? Anyone have any ideas? I also think that electric fields. Electric. Yeah, so um, that is basically how we do it. We use the electric fields. Um, so there are kind of two ways to use electric fields. So the first is the electrostatic accelerators. We basically just have two plates, um, and the electrons will go from the, the negative side to the positive side. And um, you have a potential difference across the plates. So if you have a 10 keV electron accelerator, then you would need a 10 kilovolt potential difference between this plate. and that's a pretty, you know, pretty large number of volts. Um, although with, with transformers, you can get to some very high potential differences, but this isn't really feasible when, once you get to extremely high energies. Like you can't have like a gigavolt or a terrible potential difference between two plates in a laboratory. Um, so the other way that we use that the high energy accelerators use that's a little bit more interesting is electromagnetic waves. So what you do is you have these machines called a klystron and they'll take um, basically a lot of microwaves and they'll shoot it into these cavities that look kind of funny down here and they'll bounce around back and forth and if you inject the beam at right at the right moment then it will kind of surf that wave down the cavity and that's how we accelerate most most charged particle beams um, so here are just some examples of accelerators so this is slack linear accelerator center in california and um, this is basically where i do my research um, and this is where i've worked uh, it's a 10 GeV linear electron research accelerator. Um, here's the Large Hadron Collider, which is the most famous. It's a proton, although I think they can send ions in there too. I'm not really sure. But it's a circular 6.5 TeV. That's the highest energy um, of any accelerator. So then here's a medical Linux. So this is used for cancer treatment. So actually, um, it doesn't shoot the electrons at the person. It shoots it at like a block, and it produces X-rays and shoots X-rays at the person, uh, well, at the tumor, <laughs> and um, yeah, they're also uh, proton therapy machines that really do shoot the protons at the tumor directly. So there's an industrial ion implanter, which is used for semiconductor manufacturing. I'm not sure if this particular one is used for that, but that's one of the applications of this technology. Um, and finally, I have a synchrotron light source, which produces incoherent x-rays. Um, I'll explain what incoherent means later, but this is used for imaging, a lot of things to biology and other, other fields, material science, other things. Um, and one thing you might notice about this is that the two industrial and medical accelerators are very low energy compared to the research ones. So these are also accelerators. The Van de Graaff generator is a particle accelerator, a fairly small one. It's an electrostatic one. Uh, CRT-TV is a particle accelerator pointed at your face, but don't worry. <laughs> they are very safe. Well, actually, please be careful if you ever open one up because they have pretty high voltage, but the electrons shooting at your face, that part is safe. Um, here's a cathode ray tube, and these, these were used to discover the electron by J.J. Thompson in his famous experiment. Um, if you take a modern physics class, you'll probably talk about that. And then finally, here is a dielectric laser acceleration structure, um, which is one of the um, cool technologies being researched currently. Um, so this was made by a collaboration called A-CHIP or Accelerator on a Chip, and their goal is to take particle accelerators, miniaturize them, and put them on, on little, little chips, just like, you know, computer chips or something. And um, I think this research is really amazing. Um, and then finally, here is a 
plasma accelerator, um, which is another thing that I will talk a lot about um, in Germany. And as you can see, it has this nozzle and this, this um, laser comes out of there and it hits a little gas jet and it produces an extremely high energy beam. So it's very tiny. So why are accelerators so big? And they are big. So the Large Hadron Collider is so big, it doesn't even fit one country. It is under both Switzerland and France. So there are kind of three reasons. So the um, circular electron accelerators are big because these charged particles that accelerate around the ring radiate. And once they get, um, and the, they radiate more if it's a tighter loop. So they use these really big loops to prevent a lot of energy loss when they radiate. Um, and then the large proton and ion accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider um, require these really specialized magnets um, to, to bend these, these really sort of, um, these beams that are just full of momentum. And these are um, very difficult to build these magnets. Um, actually, one at the LHC actually exploded when they first were trying to make the machine online and it set them back for, I forget exactly how long, but they're, they're very you know, complicated things to build. Um, and then finally, and this is what I'm gonna talk about the most is RF cavity breakdown, which is a fancy word for saying, if you pump too many microwaves into those cavities, which I showed in the previous slide, they kind of blow up um, and they cause permanent damage. There's electric arcs between the walls. It's just very not good. And so this kind of limits the amount of acceleration you can have. And that limit is about 10 megavolts per meter or 10 MeV per meter of energy gain per particle. So this is slack. Um, it's divided into three sections, each are 10 GeV. Um, so 10 GeV is 10,000 MeV divided by um, 10 um, MeV per meter is 1,000 meters, one kilometer. And as you can see, the three sections added up are 3.2 kilometers. So that's pretty close to, to the actual value. Um, so this is basically why linear accelerators have to be very big. Um, so one thing that our research group does a lot of is trying to make accelerators smaller with plasmas. So what exactly is a plasma? A plasma is the fourth state of matter. Um, a plasma is created when you heat a gas and you cause the electrons to separate from the atoms forming a plasma. And they typically consist of light negatively charged electrons and heavy positively charged ions. And they're basically kind of a, like a gas, but they're dominated less by sort of collisions between them and more by the, the fields that are produced when certain particles start flowing and moving. Um, and a lot of the focus in plasma physics is on nuclear fusion, um, which is, if it works, it will be an amazing source of clean energy and also studying plasmas in space like the sun and the solar wind. Uh, but we, we're a little bit different from that when we um, study beam plasma interactions in uh, my group and sort of my field at large. Um, so now I'm gonna ask another question to the audience. So how do you think a beam would react to a plasma? So I want you to basically don't think about what happens to the beam in the situation. Um, just think about what happens to the plasma. So light negatively charged electrons and heavy positively charged um, protons. I assume it's a hydrogen plasma, so the ions are protons. So what do you think would happen? Discuss with your neighbor. Yeah, people still talking? Still want to discuss or ready to? Okay, so, um, so what, do, what do people think is going to happen? Any, any? I won't raise their hand. Okay. Lots of radiation. Lots of radiation. So that is one of the things that's going to happen. Um, we were thinking that the charge distribution might be affected by the electron beam, so that there are a lot of protons that spread kind of poorly and towards the accelerating into the plasma. Okay. So um, it actually does not accelerate um, in the plasma. You need two of them to, to build a, a plasma accelerator. Um, and what what I won't do is tell you what happens. What I will do is show you what happens because I have some movies and I, I really hope these work. Um, so this is a movie. Um, so this one on the very left side is the beam. And then in the middle is going to be the um, plasma electrons. And then on the right is the plasma ions. And you can imagine like a camera is moving with the beam. So it, it looks like the beam's not moving and the plasma is sort of like moving toward the beam. When in reality, you know, it's just thinking in your head, you know, the camera's moving alongside this. So um, it actually depends, what happens depends on the charge of the beam. So first I start with a very low charge beam. So basically what you can see here is that the heavy ions, nothing really happens to them. They're just completely uniformly distributed. Um, and then in the middle, you see that um, 
the beam kind of pushes some of the electrons away and decreases the electron density. And then behind it, once it leaves, there's this positively charged region that's left. And then it will, the electrons sort of come back and they produce sort of a higher density. And this, this wave will sort of keep going and eventually damp. So now if we have a more dense beam, then it's gonna actually create a bubble. So what happens is it really just plows all of the um, plasma electrons completely out of the way. And the plasma ions still are a lot heavier, even for the lightest um, species of ion, which is hydrogen, which is just a hydrogen ion, it's just a proton. Um, it's 1,836 times heavier. So um, finally, I'm gonna go to an insane beam charge. And you can see the same bubble is produced, um, but also you start sucking in the plasma ions. And this actually, the sucking in of the plasma ions was my research at, at, as an undergraduate at UCLA. So, so it turns out you can actually use this to make an accelerator. And um, the way they work is you have a dry electron beam, which does what I just showed. Um, and it creates this bubble. And then you have the second, we call it a witness electron beam and you put it inside the bubble and the energy basically will transfer from the first one to the second one. Um, and you can kind of use this to basically slingshot the second one and you can accelerate it by thousands of times more acceleration per distance than those radio frequency cavities. Um, and basically the hope is that we can miniaturize these accelerators and vastly reduce their cost. And we could A, um, put the current sort of energy of accelerator at university lab, but also B, take existing gigantic accelerators and build this massive plasma linear collider and then explore physics beyond the standard model. So that's kind of the dream. Um, it's still under development um, to build these machines. Um, however, we have already demonstrated that you can accelerate these, these beams by massive amounts, but we have to demonstrate reliability and preserving beam quality. Those are some of the main goals. And work at Slack is going to sort of work on that. And our, our group does a lot of stuff with that. And also just to give you a sense of, of what these machines look like. So that little box is a plasma accelerator. Um, it's a nine GeV plasma accelerator. Uh, if that were a conventional accelerator, it would be maybe around a kilometer long, um, but it's about 1.3 meters, I think. So this is just how amazing these, these devices are. So, yeah. So would these accelerators be circular or linear? These are all are basically linear. Um, it might be possible to build a circular accelerator, but um, for the most part, it will be linear. So as I mentioned in like why accelerators are big, the linear, the linear ones are big for different reasons than the circular ones. And so you can't really get around the magnets not being strong enough or like the radiation. The radiation really is like a physics limit you can't get around. Magnets, strong magnets are like a really big challenge to build. And um, you always can build just a really giant accelerator, but that's actually a political problem. <laughs> and that is much harder than the plasma physics, let me tell you. So, um, so now I wanna talk a little bit about lasers. Um, so what is coherent light? Um, this is sort of one of the key concepts. And lasers basically, uh, coherent light is temporally coherent if it's a single color uh, or a single wavelength, um, as opposed to sort of a, a range of wavelengths, or at least if it's only a very narrow band of wavelengths. It's also spatially coherent um, if the waves are kind of uniform in, in, in space. The jargon way to say this would be the wavefront sort of are uniform, um, but basically what it means is you can focus it into a straight beam or down to a point. That's what spatially coherent means. So the classic example is a um, light bulb is incoherent. It's all sorts of colors. That's why it's white, it's a combination, whereas a laser pointer is coherent. Um, so now I'd like to talk about how normal lasers work. So laser is an acronym. It stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Um, so basically there are three processes you have to know, oh, sorry. So to begin, um, quantum mechanics says that if you have an electron in an atom, then it can't just have any energy. It has to have these discrete energy levels. Um, and there's sort of three processes with these energy levels you should know about. So the first is if light goes, then it hits an, an electron in one of these energy levels, it can pump it up to the next one. Um, the second is if it's at a high level, it can sort of magically drop down to the bottom one and then release light. And then finally, if it's at the top level and light hits it, it can kind of induce it to drop down and produce more light. So it kind of doubles the light there. Um, and you can see that in the, the plots in the corner. Um, and basically um, in a quantum laser, you have a pump source, and this is usually like a 
flash lamp is what we usually use. And this um, shoots a bunch of light at something called the gain medium, which is like a crystal or a gas or something which has a lot of these electrons, which have these energy levels. And the pump source causes them all to sort of get pumped to the top level. And then light will basically bounce around in this cavity. And then every time it goes, it stimulates emission from things at the top level. They go down to the bottom and amplifies the light pulse bouncing around in it. And then later on, the pump source will hit the electron and it will go back to the top. So um, this is basically how quantum lasers work. Um, and it amplifies the signal. And then eventually you have a imperfect mirror at one end and then the light will go at that end and you get a laser. So a little bit more about lasers. So they typically operate in the ultraviolet, visible, infrared, and microwaves. Microwave lasers are not called lasers, they're called masers. Um, there's kind of no point to very, very long wavelength lasers. Um, you can ask me why after, it's, it's just kind of a, a thing. Um, but yeah, so short wavelength lasers, on the other hand, though, are extremely useful because um, they allow small things to be imaged. So it's really basically impossible to take a picture of something if that thing is smaller than the wavelength of light you're trying to take a picture of it with. Um, and the reason is, is diffraction. And um, if anyone here has taken modern physics, you might talk about de Broglie wavelengths. And that's why electron microscopes are so great is because electrons, you know, as quantum objects are both particles and waves. And as waves, their wavelength is really, really, really short <laughs> compared to light. So that's why they're super useful for taking pictures of things. So the other reason why short wavelength lasers are, awesome, are very useful is that um, the photons in that light have really high energy and they can start to interact with matter. And um, this is basically why UV and X-rays are, are dangerous to people is because they'll hit your DNA and they can cause mutations that could potentially lead to diseases like cancer. Um, so that's why sort of radiation safety is very important at these long wavelengths, but also why your phone, which operates in microwaves, I think, um, and radio waves is not gonna, not gonna hurt you. Um, so finally, uh, the power needed to pump the gain medium increases very, very quickly when you go to shorter wavelengths. So the power that you need to shoot into the gain medium and only one quantum X-ray laser has been built, but, and I really, I really can't believe I'm not making this up. It was pumped by a nuclear bomb. <laughs> um, it was called Project Excalibur and I wish I could tell you more about it. Um, a lot of the details of it are still classified after 40 years. Um, what we do know is that it worked um, and we know that the laser game medium, which I believe was a metal rod, was basically instantly obliterated um, <laughs> after, after this thing um, sort of went off. And it was an underground nuclear test. And I have a picture of one of those test stands. And um, basically, Ronald Reagan had it in his mind that we would put these kinds of devices in space. And um, when the Reds shot all their missiles at us, we would, you know, detonate these disposable x-ray lasers and they would shoot down all the missiles. And it was such a ridiculous idea that people called it Star Wars. Um, so just a, a bit of fun history, but this was basically, um, this was basically the only way to make a x-ray laser for a long time. There are some short wavelength kind of soft x-ray lasers um, that are made through other methods, but they're not very that they're not that useful and they're they're kind of complicated. Like I think you can use the NIF laser. This is a tangent, but you can use the NIF laser, I think, to pump a uh, national ignition facility. And so now I would like to talk about a very, very interesting kind of laser, the second weirdest laser. Well, honestly, I feel like the nuclear bomb one should have been the weirdest laser, but um, <laughs> the second weirdest laser is called the free electron laser. Um, but before I talk about that, I do want to mention synchrotrons. Um, so as previously mentioned, charged particles radiate when they accelerate. And so circular accelerators can be used as radiation sources. Um, now this radiation is incoherent. Um, so it's like the flashlight, it's like very, you know, broad spectrum. It's, it's, not, it's not like a, a nice little beam. And um, it's very bright and it's very useful for a lot of things in biology. Biologists love to image proteins and um, it's called X-ray crystallography. And what you do is you take a protein and you crystallize it and you put the crystal next to a synchrotron. You image the diffraction pattern and then you can reconstruct the structure of the protein. Um, and one thing that people realized is that if you take this magnet, it's called either a wiggler or an undulator, depending on some um, parameters of the magnet, that basically is a bunch of alternating dipoles. And if you shoot a beam down it, it will really just wiggle as it goes down it. Um, they found that this is actually a great way to produce these incoherent X-rays. And um, 
here's sort of a picture of what synchrotrons look like and where they sort of put these, these undulator and wiggler magnets. And they usually will have like a station, an end station where you can put your experiment and then you leave and then you turn on the synchrotron. Um, yeah, so the free electron laser um, basically came about with the observation that if you have a high enough quality beam um, sent into an undulator, it will not only produce radiation, but it'll actually interact with its own radiation. And it will do this thing called micro bunching. Um, and I sort of have a picture down here of the micro bunching. So you start with a beam that is um, sort of random, the particles are kind of random in the beam. And then what ends up happening is um, through interaction with its own radiation, the beam forms these little bands at, right at the radiation wavelength. And this actually causes the radiation to become coherent. Um, and this was a, a really important observation. So another thing to say is that the FEL, it is a laser. It is not the same category of thing as a quantum laser. Um, the FEL lasing process is completely classical and it doesn't really satisfy the meaning of the acronym because it's not using stimulated emission. Um, I guess if you wanted to be sort of technical, you could call it a device that produces coherent radiation but everyone just kind of calls it a laser and has expanded their definition of laser a little bit um, once this was invented. Um, so one cool thing about FELs is they can laser at any wavelength. Um, so traditional lasers, you need a atomic transition, which has a precise frequency. And any laser physicist will know a bunch of these off the top of their head. Like the helium neon is about 621.8 nanometers. I don't know if I'm remembering that one right, but um, basically the FEL, you don't have to remember those. It can be at any wavelength. Um, it just depends on the magnet parameters and the beam energy and the beam quality. So um, when it was first developed, um, these FELs basically amplified the, the laser from a quantum laser. So it was in a reflective cavity and it would amplify this and it would produce these really high power um, laser pulses, but um, it wasn't very short wavelength. So it's very difficult to build these short wavelength FELs, which are called XFELs if they're in x -rays. Um, And the reason is you need a really high energy beam and thus a massive particle accelerator. Um, you also need a very high quality beam, which didn't actually exist at the time that FEL was invented. Um, and then you can't have mirrors. So it needs to just be a single pass. Like it goes down the undulator and then it produces the or it micro bunches completely in the undulator and then produces the pulse. And there's no like mirrors that bounce, keep bouncing back. So in the 1980s at Los Alamos National Laboratory, there's this invention of the photo injector, which uses the photoelectric effect, uh, which is what Einstein won the Nobel Prize for. So you shoot a laser at a metal and it will produce electrons. And then you can use this to create a beam. Um, and this could produce these extremely high quality beams and suddenly the FEL became possible. So in 1992, this man named Claudio Pellegrini proposed converting the slack linear collider, um, which they discovered the quark with it. Um, and then they were like, what do we do with it now? Um, so they, he could propose converting it into a one angstrom hard X-ray FEL. So then finally in 2009, the Linac Coherent Light Source or LCLS at Slack became the very first operational XFEL. Um, and I just want to show a picture of it because I think that the scale and kind of the wonder of the scientific instrument is lost um, just listening to me describe it. Um, it is a truly amazing machine um, and it is really, really one of a kind. Um, a few, a few other X-ray laser, a few other X-ray field electron lasers have been built around the world. To date, this is still the only one in the United States. It's been upgraded, it's now LCLS2. Um, so Amanda works there, so chat with her. Um, so here's a picture of the undulator hollow inside. So this is where those special undulator magnets are, are located. They're in those funny tubes. Um, so also in an accelerator, everything has to be in vacuum because you don't want your beam hitting particles in the air. So everything has to be in vacuum. So, okay, um, before I go to that slide, one thing I wanna say is that um, many scientists in their life uh, spend their careers trying to take an existing technology and improve it by a factor of two, or by a factor of three, or maybe even by a factor of 10. Um, so when the LCLS turned on, the photon brightness of the machine was 1 billion times higher than the next best, best instrument in the world which is something that really doesn't ha happen very often in science. And it's really an amazing achievement. Um, 
It's, it's actually kind of funny because that guy, uh, Claudio Pellegrini, who proposed turning Slack into a XFL, had this kind of motto that you want to make a, your instrument better by a factor of, of tau or two pi. Um, and anything more than that, people won't believe you can do it. And anything less than that, they won't care because it's not that much of an improvement. But he, he improved it by nine orders of magnitude. Um, another funny story, my old uh, professor um, at UCLA, James Roseswag, knew Claudio Pellegrini and told him he didn't think it could work. <laughs> And then he was proven very wrong. And then here is a picture of a man I've met meeting with a man I have never met. Um, Obama is the man I've never met. Um, so he, you know, really made a massive contribution to science. And he won the Enrico, Enrico Fermi Prize for that. Um, we got to meet Obama. So a little bit about some of the science you can do with these machines. So first, um, the first picture is actually a movie of a benzene ring absorbing a photon and then breaking up. And I want to stress that this is not a simulation. This is based on real data. So I'll play it right now. So um, honestly, the fact that we can image something like this, like a chemical reaction like this, is really mind blowing. And um, to say this to a chemist, even, even you know, 20 years ago would have been almost absurd. Um, and then here's a protein imaged that is important for African sleeping sickness. Um, so most proteins are actually pretty hard to crystallize. Some proteins are easy to crystallize. Some proteins, you know, grad students have spent years trying to crystallize and they finally do it. And some proteins you really just kind of can't crystallize. And so um, for the um, proteins that are very small crystals, and at some point, uh, people think they can actually image single proteins, um, although that hasn't really happened yet. Um, XFILs are very useful. And then finally, I have some um, condensed matter physics. I don't really understand um, how to interpret that plot, but something pretty cool about superfluid. So to say, what I'm trying to say is you can do a lot of things with XFILs. Um, you can also do more dense matter, you know, um, anyway, a million, a million kind of things with these machines. So uh, one of the major goals of my field is to sort of combine these two technologies that I've been talking about, the X-ray field electron laser and the plasma accelerator. Um, and the goal is you can make a XFEL that is not a kilometer long. Um, you can make it that would fit in the laboratory and cost less than, slack cost about a billion dollars. Um, I don't know the exact number, but it's somewhere around there. Um, oops. And currently plasma accelerators can produce electron beams that are almost perfect for XFELs, but the problem is they have this one parameter called the energy spread, and it is way too big. Um, and we've made some progress in China. Um, a extreme ultraviolet FEL was demonstrated last year. I got into nature as a very sort of big achievement, but still we haven't gotten to X-rays yet. Um, so now, finally, I'd like to talk about my research on the ion channel laser. So an ion channel laser shoots a very, um, so an ion channel laser basically what works like this. You shoot a very high power laser through a gas to create a narrow plasma. Next, you use this giant drive beam, which is right there, um, to plow the plasma electrons out of the way, creating this uniform density ion channel, like in the second movie I showed. Um, and then you have a second electron beam, which kind of has an offset, and then will basically oscillate. And it's just like in the undulator, in which it produces radiation, and it interacts with the sun radiation. And actually, it micro snakes. It does a micro bunch. but. You know, um, it basically changes its form and then starts emitting coherent laser light. So um, yeah, that is how an ion channel laser works. So why are they interesting? So ion channel lasers, because the physics is slightly different from lays using much lower quality electron beams. Um, so it can use 10 times higher energy spread. Energy spread, you want, you want a low energy spread that's usually considered better. Um, so basically instead of, so basically this could allow lasing with the kind of beams we can get from plasma accelerators. The gain is absolutely ridiculous. Um, you can laze in an extremely short distance, like a meter. Um, and then it might be able to, it might be possible to engineer the ICL such that the electron beam kind of accelerates to replenish the energy it loses to radiation. And this could allow even higher power X-ray pulses. So I think LCLS is in the gigawatts and you might be able to get up to the terawatts with an ion channel laser. I'm not entirely sure. Um, and then there's some other cool stuff, like they have complicated polarization physics and can produce elliptically polarized light, which is something that we're pretty interested in. 
Um, so also, why are they hard? So like, those are all the good things. What are, what are sort of the caveats to this? So the first is um, the beam shape has to be very precisely controlled going into an ICL, which is quite challenging. And a lot of this stuff, by the way, I've been figuring out over the last year with my advisor. Um, so creating an ion channel that is the right length, width, density, correct alignment, correct like sort of um, input ramps and output ramps, that's actually very challenging. Um, and then also the plasma accelerators that do exist aren't very reliable. Um, like the beams shot to shot are very different and they're also not very power efficient. Um, and then finally, nobody has actually built an ion channel laser before. Um, my, my talk is called the world's weirdest laser. It should be the world's weirdest laser that doesn't exist yet. <laughs> um, so um, a little bit sort of about what my research is. So I developed do math to describe the core physics of the ion channel laser. Um, some of the math is actually pretty serious. And um, despite the fact that none of it's quantum, I think people think just because something's classical means it's easy, that's not true. Um, I also kind of explore the parameter space and I think about, because this is applied physics, so I think about if we build the machine either today or in 10 years or 20 or 30 years, what are the kind of practical limitations and what could we feasibly build? And, you know, you, you allow yourself a little bit of room for advancements and things, but ultimately you have to stay grounded in reality. Um, and then also a lot of the math just can't really describe the full physics and we really need computer simulations to do these. So I run a lot of simulations on a supercomputer called um, Pori that is at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Um, and they're called particle and cell simulations. And we try to correctly simulate the physics, which is actually very challenging to do because um, you have to have algorithms that are both correct and also run very quickly. Um, and then finally, we're going to try to build one of these ion channel lasers. And a lot of what I do and a lot of what I really will do in the next year is sort of planning, how are we gonna take the experimental constraints at Slack and translate that into an experiment we can actually do. So here is a simulation that I have for everybody. And I ran this on that supercomputer. Um, and it is of the micro snaking process. Um, so this is the beam oscillating. And again, it's moving with the um, beam, so. We can sort of see these, these bands start to form. It's the beginning of micro bunching or micro snaking. Um, this simulation is not entirely mathematically correct. It kind of shows the principle, but we're still working on getting these simulations to really accurately represent the physics. Um, then here's a picture of me at the in the tunnel at 4 a.m. <laughs> After work midnight shifts sometimes, um, they're called owl shifts. So our group plans to demonstrate the first ion channel laser ever built at this facility called Passit 2 at Slack. So um, we're basically going to not go straight to x-rays. We're gonna start with visible light, probably violet at 400 nanometers. Um, but if we build this, it will probably be the most complicated violet laser ever built using a kilometer long electron accelerator. <laughs> um, and it will be kind of a, a crazy, crazy experiment. So we won't, actually get beam time until 2024. Um, these big facilities have a habit of getting delayed very easily. So um, a lot of the schedule is still TBD, but um, that's sort of our goal is to start doing experiments in 2024. And if successful, this could be a stepping stone toward eventually building a cheap, compact X-ray ion channel laser that would fit um, the very cheap, very compact under every child's Christmas tree and solve all of our societal problems. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, so a few final points. Um, first is, um, unfortunately, there aren't very many opportunities for undergraduates to do accelerator physics at Steve Boulder. Um, so basically the two big opportunities for undergraduates are the REU and the SULI program. So the REU would um, allow you to travel to a different university um, for summer research. And there are a handful of universities in the country that do accelerator physics. Um, and then the SULI program will allow you to go do research at a US national lab. Um, so they're both competitive programs. And if you're interested in, in accelerator physics, I highly suggest you look into them. Um, also, it doesn't have to be for accelerator physics. People do REUs for other things and SULI's for other things too. Um, so national laboratories have accelerator physics positions open to BS graduates. Um, one, one such position is accelerator operator. Um, and these are great opportunities if you want more experience before you go to grad school or you want to um, 
I don't know, just get the opportunity to go work there. Um, and then finally, um, as an applied field, there are a lot of industry opportunities um, for physics PhDs and also BSs and accelerator physics. And a good friend of mine works at Radio Beam Technologies in Santa Monica, and they build accelerators for industry, medicine, and also um, for academia. So if, if we need a magnet and we don't want to build it, we can call them and they'll build it for us. Um, However, um, one thing to know about industry is they tend to work on more low energy accelerators and, and some of the less out there technology concepts because they're a little bit more grounded in, in the economic reality of, of you know, the private sector. And then finally, this is kind of a subtle point, but um, because so much research goes on at national labs and not universities and national labs don't graduate students, there's a little bit of a supply demand mismatch um, between who's graduating and who's hiring. And this is actually pretty beneficial um, for people in the field. It means it's a little bit easier to get a job than in some other fields. Um, so this is just something you know I like to mention. Um, so yeah, so another thing, just come say hi to me anytime. Uh, I always love to chat with people. I'm happy to get coffee, whether it's about accelerator physics or career advice or my experience being trans in LGBT in physics. Um, another thing is I am trying to get the department to offer an accelerator physics course. Um, I wish I could teach it. I don't think they'll let me. Um, but if if that is ever offered or you ever get the opportunity, I highly suggest you, you do take it. Um, and then I will leave you with a fun fact that you can ask me about sometime if you're interested, which is you can actually crystallize beams. Um, and then, yeah, there's my contact information. It's just my name at colorado.edu. And then thank you so much. Um, I'd like to uh, thank CU, CU Prime, uh, Slack, U.S. Department of Energy and all my collaborators, um, and also Victor Yun Van Hansel who helped me re rehearse my talk, and also the few friend people who also helped me rehearse my talk. So yeah, uh, any questions? Okay, and before I go to questions, yeah, can you go to the next slide there? Um, or do you have the? Okay, yeah, yeah. I don't think there's much there anyway. Uh, the only announcement we have is that we have one more C Prime talk of the semester. It's going to be two weeks from today, which is the week right before fall break. So make sure you don't miss it. It'll be a great opportunity to de-stress and uh, get food in your body before you're finishing all your assignments. Um, but yeah, we have plenty of time for questions. So does anybody have any? Right. Yeah. They were supposed to build a uh, particle accelerator in Texas, I think it was, and then they canceled the entire project and they uh, laid off all the physicists that were supposed to be there. Do you know why? There is um, a lot that has been said about the superconducting super collider. It was kind of the US's answer to um, CERN when it, CERN was, well, um, the Large Hadron Collider hadn't been built yet, but the US basically um, proposed this massive um, circular particle collider in Texas. There were a lot of political sort of issues with it. Basically, everybody was really excited. And then they chose Texas, and then only the Texas senators were excited. Um, there was a little bit of mismanagement. Um, again, for, for dumb political reasons, like they put it in Texas and not like attach like Fermi Lab and stuff. Um, but it's it's kind of a sad story. <laughs> um, also, we we're going to ask Japan um for support and then george hw bush threw up on the japanese prime minister and that conversation never happened i swear to god this is real i swear to god uh, so like i don't know you can read about the superconducting super collider if you're interested um but it's you know it's how we almost built uh the equivalent of the large hadron collider in texas lost money they it up and everybody got canceled they paid more money you have a question? Yeah. So um, in the beginning, we were talking about how uh, plasma accelerators was, and then is ICL a like, more specific application of the plasma accelerator? So um, basically, there are these two technologies. There's the free electron laser and the plasma accelerator. And um, you kind of can't combine it because the beams that come from the plasma accelerators have two high energy spread to laser in a free electron laser. But the ion channel laser is an alternative to the free electron laser that allows a much higher energy spread. So that would allow you to combine the two concepts, basically. Um, 
The ion channel laser actually, because it uses plasma and not just magnets, um, it has some similarities with plasma accelerators. Um, so, yeah, I mean, one sort of goal of our group is we want to take everything that conventional accelerators do and make it into plasmas and make it better. So acceleration, we can do with plasmas. Focusing, we can make a plasma lens, and that actually is a lot better than a lot of magnets. Um, and we might be able to make all sorts of cool plasma, plasma things to replace traditional accelerator physics sort of parts. So I think you had mentioned that the preliminary goal of the XEL is like a meter to weigh up to a meter. Is that like a theoretical thing right now? Or is that just like a whole thing? So, um, Amanda, do you know how long the slat like the LCLS undulator fault is? It's pretty long, right? It's like really a whole kilometer for the engine. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so maybe like 500 meters. So, um, free electron lasers typically have a long distance of undulator. Um, so that's like 500 meters, and that's like a lot. Um, the ion channel laser is a lot less than that. Um, we think we can laser in a meter. We actually only really have like two meters of space in the facet, which is like one of those big constraints that we just we can't we can't do the ICL if it doesn't laser in two meters because that's all we have at, at facet. So there are a lot of sort of constraints like that at facet, you know, and like. Um, beam energy and, and just the time and personnel and cost and like, um, it shares the tunnel with LCLS, which is always running. Um, so we have to like go in there for like one day and work 24 hours. And, and so, yeah. uh, thanks for having thought. Oh, thank you. Why is the ion channel laser just doing a channel? It was, you said it has to be like a pair of like, right? So um, basically, um, Basically, um, if you didn't have a narrow channel plasma, if you just had like a big plasma, then you'd actually create a acceleration bubble that's the same as a plasma weak field accelerator. But we don't really want the witness beam to accelerate. That's actually bad. It prevents lasing. Um, so what you can do is if you choose this really narrow plasma, then when these electrons sort of are out of the way, there's a lot less of a force that's pulling it back than if this whole area were filled with ions. And so they kind of just um, produces a massive bubble and they kind of go off to infinity and we, we don't care about them. Because what we really care about is sort of the um, the side to side focusing force. So there's a question in the chat. I'm not sure if it's tongue in cheek, but trying to uh, test your, how accessible you can make things. Um, can you explain spherical vessel functions with an analogy that involves dogs? Uh, if you don't want to answer that, I would also ask uh, with that simulation that you showed me, and you mentioned that it uh, wasn't quite mathematically correct. So what thing did this simulate? Um, yes, I, I think I might know who that is asking that question. Um, <laughs> I, I think I know. Um, but I'm glad you didn't ask me about longitudinal space charge driven micro bunching instability. Um, so, as for this one, uh, so the way particle and cell codes work is you solve for the fields on a grid, but the particles can be anywhere. Um, and like you basically you compute the field at each particle, and then you push the particles, and then you deposit the charge onto the grid, and then you solve Maxwell's equations on the grid. And you kind of do this loop, it's called the pick loop to sort of keep going and solving how the particles move and how the fields change and all that stuff. Um, but there are some challenges with getting it to correctly simulate real physics. Uh, one of the challenges is that the grid that it's used is not, doesn't correctly reproduce the vacuum. Um, it actually is like, it's as if it were a material um, and it has dispersion and that's a pain. Um, so that's like sort of one of the reasons why simulating these is challenging. Um, another reason is just correctly computing the initial fields is really challenging. And I actually have been, I wrote some Fortran to do that and my Fortran does not work. And I don't know, well, actually I figured out why today, um, but it was kind of a not good answer because it's not, I forgot if a factor of two, it's, it's something that has to do with the way the algorithm works that it's not going to work unless I make substantial changes to it. Um, but yeah, so, 
there's just a lot of challenges to quickly simulating these. And there are also sort of limitations on the computational resources that my group has. Um, so yeah, here's, here's some of you again. So it's just a laser pulse, um, like a C laser pulse that is interacting with this. And you sort of start to see this, this micro snaking as we call it. Uh, you said part of your job was to uh, come up with the task that you're describing the possible to support some uh, some existing ones. Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate uh, on the work so in terms of what's or how you do that and uh, how this is like where do you come up with the ideas you have Okay, so um Basically, the nice thing is that I don't have to just pull all the new math out of the hat. Um, so over the past, you know, many decades, a lot of research has um, focused on describing the physics of free electron lasers, which is very similar to ion channel lasers, but there are a couple like pretty significant differences. So what I basically do is I, I spend a lot of time trying to read papers and understand ion channel or understand free electron laser physics. And then I say, okay, how do I take sort of the, the tools they've developed and apply it to the ion channel laser, which has some different stuff going on. Um, so that's sort of the pure math and understanding the real core of the um, physics. There are also some other things like understanding the kind of constraints that are on this, this device, um, like sort of practical constraints. For example, um, trying to give a, a good one, like, um, you want to create this narrow channel beam. Let me. You want to create this narrow channel plasma, but if you're guiding student, then it will actually just ionize the gas and the heat, and so that's not. So that will be a white plasma, and that's not very good. Um, or like other issues, like if your witness beam is too dense, then it's going to suck in the ions, and it's going to do all this weird stuff. Um, so a lot of it is like trying to figure out what regimes are these effects not important and how does that like chop off parts of this product parameter space of like all the possible parameters that could work in a feasible ICL. So yeah. With you, Amanda. Uh, yeah, on this topic, I think that's really interesting. Um, so there are no undulators. Um, it's entirely due to the ion channel. Um, so that's just um, completely the reason why. There is something called the ion channel guided free electron laser, which uses a ion channel to help focus a beam in a free electron laser. Um, but the lasing is still the same as an FBL. It's just strong focusing. Whereas this is like a different mechanism than. But it is having to wiggle back and forth. Like yeah. The yeah, it's just like the undulators. How, I guess I'm surprised that like the lasing is uniform and that like you tend to have to get like the lasing is like the same micro-bunching and like with the ion channel, we like very distributed as far as. Yeah, so since there are so many, um, so it's in a gas that you ionize. And so the gas, you know, is, is sort of some uniform density, uniform pressure in some region. Um, and then you shoot the laser in and then you shoot your beam in. And all this happens so quickly. Like these beams move to basically the speed of light. Um, and so it doesn't have time to sort of evolve. And so there's so many ions in the ion channel laser that it just acts as like a big uniform, positively charged region. And if you take in electromagnetism, um, basically, um, if you do Gauss's law on like a uniform um, region with a cylinder, then you'll get a linear focusing force. And that means that it's in sinusoidal oscillation. Um, there are kind of subtle differences because the undulator magnets are magnetic field and this is an electric field. And so there's some subtle differences that kind of put these weird constraints on um, the physics of the ICL. But um, in general, it's fairly similar in most regards. But since it outputs a magnetic field, wouldn't it also therefore influence the electric field? Because that's what the Maxwell's laws say. Yeah, so um the um there are, I mean, there are a lot of magnetic fields in this. It's just like a weird, I don't know how to say this in a very precise scientific way, but like electric fields are stronger than magnetic fields. And that's why we accelerate particles with electric fields and not magnetic fields is because it's just hard to do because magnetic fields are really weak. Um, and so basically like 
the motion of those, like of the wake is gonna produce some magnetic fields and the light produced, like the X-rays produced by the ICL or whatever wavelength of light it is, is going to have, you know, it's a wave, so it has electric and magnetic components, but it's really the electric fields we care the most about. Um, yeah. And then the magnetic undulators use permanent magnets to make sure that they only have a static electric or a static magnetic field, so there's no electric field. So. One more question. Um, you mentioned two more. You mentioned um, like designing like algorithms and like programming things like that. Like, like in terms of like the actual work you put into your algorithms and just like programming in general. Like, how like many like lines of code like goes into like one single al algorithm that you use for analysis? <laughs> I've never seen any of these things, but they sound like. Monstrous. Yes. Um, these are gigantic Fortran code bases. Um, the nice thing is that I don't really develop it. So basically, when we talk about computational physics, there are kind of two kinds of programming people do. The first is really developing these algorithms that run on these heavy duty clusters um, and really, you know, like the core algorithms. And the second is, is learning how to use these codes and write input files and analyze the data and do stuff, that stuff. So most people who do computational physics tend to just sort of do data analysis of other people's codes. I do mostly that. I do some actually writing the heavy duty codes, um, but there's a team at UCLA's plasma simulation group. Um, my collaborator, who I thank at the end, sorry, I accidentally put two thanks slides on this. Um, my collaborator, uh, Jacob Pierce at UCLA and also um, Jordan Mori, they're at the UCLA plasma simulation group and they um, work really hard to make this code called OSIRIS that is absolutely wonderful for simulating these things as the most advanced algorithms. And it's, it's been tested. Um, so people know that the results are accurate from it. Um, so yeah. If you took the super uh, computer simulation that you might have to do and you ran them on your laptop, how long would it take? So um, actually I do run a lot of them on my laptop, um, which is pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I so basically the way it works is I try to take the physical principle, which is that sort of micro bunching, micro snaking action, and I try to sort of get it show that on my laptop because my laptop's easy to run things on, and I don't have to like log in and think about how many hours I'm burning and like wait for it to sit in the queue to run. Um, so once I sort of have something that kind of works, what I do is I bring it to the big computer and you just increase the resolution to actually get sort of the real physics and like publication quality results. Um, and I gotta say, like we definitely, my group does some heavy duty simulations. There are some people out there that, that really do some absolutely crazy simulations, like these massive, you know, that use like a whole cluster. And we don't really do that, we just kind of, yeah, we're 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 the highest power supercomputer users, but we do have to run our simulations on that. Um, so I think that my lab has about a thousand node hours um, left, and each node is about sixty-eight cores. So just think about you know a thousand times sixty-eight over like eight for an eight-core laptop. That, that's what however many hours is we. You know, the scale of things we run. So, so if you have any other questions, feel free to talk to Claire individually for the last thing for one more time. Yeah, I want to chat with me after. I'm happy to answer questions. And yeah, please, you know, email me. I like talking to people. <laughs> <laughs>